He came back here after, after college and law school to practice at Gerber Law Offices, and he currently sits on the Board of Directors for the Northeastern Nevada Museum, and we are super happy to have him here today, and I will turn the time over to him. Thank you all. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Diet, for inviting me here today. And I'm, it's my pleasure to share this very exciting story with you. It's an old story, a very, very little known story. And I'll tell you how I put all the pieces together, but it was through a variety of books and, and acquaintances that I, that I have that this all came together. Um, and it also is intertwined with my family history. My great-great-grandfather uh, was a pioneer that came to the West, and um, it, it, this story involves his son, Roan Clausen, or Roni Clausen, who would be like a great-great-uncle of mine. So the title is, Not All of Our Relatives Were Heroes. If you look far enough into your family history, you might find some, a couple of bad apples. <laughs> um, back in 1862, um, the Nevada Territory had just been created, and uh, at one time, all of Nevada and Utah was was part of the Utah Territory, and I believe it was in 1861 that Nevada was carved out, and so this is what, what the uh, map would have looked like in 1862. Um, how many of you are familiar with the route of the Pony Express or the Overland Stage route? Okay, that route was was uh, a more direct route than going where the California Trail is, and it was a faster overland route for uh, mail delivery. Obviously, that's where they chose the Pony Express route. And prior to the mail being delivered by Pony Express, it was a trail that was built by Howard Egan and other pioneers who were carrying goods back and forth by, by mules and wagon. And, um, this shows roughly the road across Nevada. It's south of us. goes just north of Eureka. And, uh, and uh, Justin and Stephanie French are here. They ride Pony Express with me every year. And we ride that section just north of Eureka uh, from the Roberts Creek uh, to the Diamonds. And here is, uh, here's a picture of the stops along the Pony Express route. Um, you can see the ones in Nevada there. We ride. Uh, let's see if I can work this, there we go. Uh, so here's Ruby Valley, you're all familiar with that. And then there's Jacob's Well. Then Diamond Springs, this is on the, the Eureka side of those Diamond Mountains. And then Sulphur Springs, Roberts Creek. And that's the section that we ride every year. It's about a 40 mile section um, to reenact the Pony Express. But you see here, one of the stops is called Egan. And and that's the gentleman I referred to earlier is Howard Egan helped blaze this trail and when the Pony Express Company came in, he helped build the stations along the route and one of them is named after him. And uh, that's myself and my wife riding Pony Express. Uh, you can see it's uh, from the Diamonds to Robert Creek. As you're driving down to Eureka, uh, you may be familiar with the sign in the pass that says Garden Pass. And there's a kiosk there. That's where, where that's right where the trail crosses the road. And we end up camping there a lot and, and doing the ride. Um, this is a Pony Express marker at that Diamond Springs station, just on the Eureka side. And you can see the canyon above it. Um, the pass is about three miles above this marker, and we ride that pass. Uh, this marker commemorates. Um, a uh, an episode where the Pony Express rider was attacked by Indians and both the rider and the horse were shot with arrows as they were coming down that pass. And the horse died. The rider's name was Boston. The horse's name was what? Because it had a distinctive question mark <laughs> blaze on its head. So they called the horse what? But that horse died from its injuries, but it carried its rider safely to the station. So 
So it was a dangerous time, and you never knew quite what you were going to get on the trail. And the Egans, uh, Howard Egan, and his two sons spent many days and years on this trail, and they have a book uh, called Pioneering the West that chronicles all of the experiences that they had here in Nevada on the trail in, in building the stations and, and carrying the mail and carrying other goods. And it's just fascinating. You read that and you just can't believe that all that happened. But I can't go into all the stories right now. Um, but the book was given to me by Glenn Guthrie. Yeah. This is a, a more modern copy of it. He gave me an original version that was published in 1919 uh, by the Egan boys. When they got older, they wrote down all their stories. And it's a fascinating read if any of you are interested in it. You can, you can buy this book. Um, but as when Glenn gave me this book, I made a connection because he writes about how um, the Egan boys were out on the trail. And, and I'll get into the story a little bit more, but there's a reference to my great great uncle in this book. And that's what prompted me to give this presentation is I put that the, the story of the Egans and the Pony Express together with what happened on the trail with my great great uncle. So this is uh, Howard Egan Sr. And then those are his boys. And this is my great great grandfather, Moses Kloss, and he immigrated from upstate New York and settled in Utah in the 1860s. And this is a, a copy of the wagon train report from 1849 when they came over the plains and it lists Moses Kloss's family here. And Roan was with him, Roan being the, the one I'm going to tell the story about. This is a picture of Moroni Claussen. Uh, you can't quite see it with the screen there, but it says circa 1859. And so in 1862, when this story took place, he would have been about 22 years old. I'm assuming he's about 19 in that picture. And then uh, this is a picture of the bounty hunter that tracked him down. You may have all heard of or in Porter Rockwell. This also was taken 1862. So this picture would have been taken the very year that this story occurred. Uh, this is a picture of the Deep Creek Station, one of the Pony Express routes. And I'm assuming this was taken later than 1862 because that's a very well-built um, fortress. You know, that, I think in the early days it was mostly just logs. Um, all right, so let me get into the story now about Roan. Um, the moral of the story is there's two rules in life. Don't do stupid things, and don't hang out with stupid people. Roan, Roan broke both of those rules, and he ended up dead. And what happened is he was about 22 years old, and um, he had fallen in with some bad friends as a teenager. And one of those friends' name was Lot Huntington, um, whose father was a little bit, had a colorful, char colorful character and had gotten into some troubles. And likewise, his son was also into trouble. And so he fell into this gang with Lot Huntington, um, and they were indicted for stealing cattle for, the first, for their first offense. And it was, they were convicted, it was in the newspapers. And they didn't reform their ways. And uh, the next thing that happened is uh, there was a governor that was sent from Washington to govern the Utah Territory named Governor Dawson. And he'd only been in Utah for a few short months, but um, had created a lot of scandal already. He'd apparently made some improper advances on a widow, which earned him a lot of uh, hate from the community. and. And these bad boys, they um, attacked him in a, up, in, up by Park City and beat him. And so he was, he was beaten. And then the law of the territory was after these, these boys, La Huntington, Ron Clausen, um, a few other, a few other uh, young men. And at the same time, Lot stole a strong box from a livery you know, back then they carried their money in strong boxes um, in the old west, and he stole some money, 
Uh, he also stole a favorite horse named Brown Sal from, from a fairly wealthy owner. And that owner went straight to um, uh, Port Araqua to track them down. And they were seen headed south, and they were going down toward the Lehigh area, and, then, and it was assumed they were headed out on the, the uh, Overland Trail. Um, and probably, I mean, naturally they're, they were trying to escape the territory and go to California where they wouldn't be arrested. So the story goes that, that Rome um, got word from Lot Huntington that there were arrest warrants out for them. And so Lot says, Rome, you gotta come with me to California. Rome, according to his family history, went back to his house. He had a young wife who was pregnant at the time and a, and a son already at that time. And apparently he told his family, I've got to go because, you know, they're, they're going to arrest me. And, and, uh, and so he, he took off with Lot. Um, so, again, don't do stupid things. Don't hang out with stupid people. And uh, they head out on the trail. Well, when, when Porter Rockwell's on your trail, you better not sleep or eat or stop because he doesn't. And he's going he's gonna to find you. Um, he was a... He had a reputation as a bounty hunter and, and uh, could be fairly ruthless <coughs> in capturing his prisoners. So um, Roan and his companions headed out. They made it as far as uh, Faust Station on the trail, which was probably just a little more than a day's ride. And, uh, and they made the mistake of stopping because Porter Rockwell didn't stop. He commandeered a stagecoach and went all night and arrived at that station and was waiting for them when they woke up the next morning. And so first the station master came out of the out of the station and Porter told him, tell those men to come out and to surrender. But Lot didn't surrender. He came out with a gun drawn, went straight to the stable where he took the stolen horse and it was a very fine thoroughbred and he took that horse and was leading it out and ready to jump on and try to escape. And for some reason, that horse backed up or reared. And when it did, Porter Rockwell shot him and killed Lon. So then he loaded him back into the stagecoach and took him and Roan and another prisoner back to the Salt Lake City Jail. And that's, that's where I found the reference in this book is that when they were on the trail, uh, and Porter Rockwell commandeered that stagecoach and was pursuing these guys. Um, the the Howard or the Egan boys happened to be on the trail that night, and they recorded this in their journal. Uh, this is what he writes. He says, um, "All was well, although there was a sleet storm when we started from a ranch just south of the city where the cattle had been pastured, and they were actually moving a herd of cattle to Ruby Valley and back. So that's a local connection here." And they got the outfit ready. He says that they camped on the divide that separates Utah and Cedar Valleys. And while we were eating dinner, Lot Huntington rode into camp, ate dinner with us. And during the conversation, I learned that he was going out west and might join us later on and travel with us as far as Ruby Valley. That was the last I ever saw of Lot. And, and also another thing they comment on is that after this plot was discovered that they were actually running from the law, they thought, oh, maybe these guys are going to circle back. And they were plotting to steal the cattle and take them to California, too. So, so these were not good guys. So the next night, we camped in Rush Valley, about 10 or 12 miles east of the Faust Mail Station. We were camped close to the road, and in the night, heard a stage going west pass by. I thought it strange, for it was not a mail day. As they were only as they were only running tri weekly at that time, and I was more puzzled when next morning, as we were about to move camp, another stage came from the west and stopped opposite our campfire. And Porter Rockwell, the sheriff or deputy, sang out, "Hello, kids! All right?" And, and we replied, "Yes, all right so far." And they exchanged some words because they knew each other and they knew um, Porter knew their father, Howard Egan, and. Then uh, he writes, I noticed that those in the coach that I could see were all heavily armed. I suppose there had been a rabbit hunt, as there were on frequent occasions in the fall. 
When we reached Faust Station, we found that there had been a hunt. Not a rabbit hunt, but a man hunt. And the men that were hunted were in that stagecoach with the sheriff. One being <coughs> Watt Huntington, being dead, and the other a prisoner. The other prisoner would have been Roman Clausen. And the latter was killed while trying to escape after arriving in Salt Lake City. So even though it doesn't mention Rome's name in here, I knew this story faintly because I knew from our family history that one of Moses Clausen's sons had been um, indicted for being a horse thief and that he was shot while trying to escape from the Salt Lake City jail. And so I, I thought, wow, that, that must be him. And then I had also read a biography on Porter Rockwell at one time where it had described this episode. Again, not in great detail, but it mentioned that he had gone um, all night and captured these guys as they were trying to flee the territory. Um, and, and again, that, that, that book didn't reference Rome's name either, but I, by putting all three sources together, I was able to realize that it was all the same story. Um, so, so uh, the prisoners were taken back to Salt Lake City, and Rowan and his friend were shot while trying to escape the Salt Lake City jail. And we don't really know the circumstances of that. Um, but uh, then uh, this is a this is a newspaper article that talks about uh, that reports on. Roan Clausen being indicted for stealing cattle. Um, and it says that uh, thieving has been carried on to a great extent of late in this part of the territory, and it has been borne with till forbearance is no longer a virtue, if it ever was such. <laughs> the people seem determined now that the law shall be executed and an end put to the felonious operations which have despoiled many of a large portion of their stock, which was running on the ranges, because back then it was just open range. So these, these guys were convicted and fined, and, and, uh, and then they went on to do, uh, you know, Lot went on to, to pursue his criminal career even further. But that's where the story begins. That's all very interesting, but this is when it gets very interesting. Rome was shot trying to escape the Salt Lake City jail. And no one immediately came to claim the body, so back then they buried people fairly quickly. And so the sheriff, out of his goodness, purchased a brand new suit of clothes, a suit for Rome to be buried in, and a coffin. So they buried him in the pauper's grave in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. And then a few days later, George Klaus and his brother um, came to claim the body and remove it down to Draper where the family was living. And when they dug up the body, to their surprise and horror, the body was naked, face down in the grave, no coffin. And so they were just disgusted with this. Well, how could they possibly bury a person that way? So he went first to the sheriff, and the sheriff says, oh no, we purchased him a suit of clothes. And so they referred him to the sexton of the cemetery, and the sexton says, oh yeah, we buried him with a suit of clothes. So then they went to the grave digger's house. The grave digger's name was Jean Baptiste. He was from Australia, a um, Frenchman that had immigrated through Australia. So uh, Australia had a reputation back then, right? 1860, so, so um, they went to Jean Baptiste's house. And there they found his wife, who they say was dim-witted, meaning she uh, probably um, wasn't very intelligent, but here she is um, in the house, and they started looking around, and the house is just full of trunks and, and uh, you know, clothing and hats and lace, you know, all the things that you bury people in. So they immediately realized what's going on here. And so they then went looking for Jean Baptiste and they got the sheriff. And this sheriff was a really, really good man. Uh, his name was Henry Heath. Um, but when this happened, they went and found Jean Baptiste. And, and it happened to be in the graveyard. And, and, uh, and I'll read to you what Henry Heath wrote.
So he wrote later about this confrontation. He says, I at once charged him, John Baptiste, with robbing the dead. And he fell upon his knees, calling God to witness that he was innocent. But the evidence was too strong. And I choked the wretch into a confession <laughs> when he begged for his life as a human being never pleaded before. I dragged him to a grave near my daughter's and pointing to it inquired, did you rob that grave? And he, Henry Heath had just lost an infant or a young daughter that was buried in that cemetery. Um, and he, so he points to a grave near hers and says, did you rob this grave? And he says, yes. Then, directing his attention to the mound of earth which covered my child's remains, I repeated the question with bated breath and with the firm resolve to kill him should he answer in the affirmative. And he says, no, no, not that one, not that one. That answer saved the miserable coward's life. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they uh, took and... and uh, put John Baptiste in the local jail, but he wasn't safe there. News traveled fast and the entire community was in an uproar because uh, it was later discovered he robbed about 300 graves over the course of four or five years. And so Ron Clausen's burial was the one that caused the, the, the discovery of, of the grave robbing. So, so he did one good thing in his life. Um, so, so this is, uh, this is the news article that came out later. Um, there were news articles at the time, but this is actually 1893. Um, so this would have been about 30 years later. And you know some of these guys are getting older, like Henry Heath and stuff, so they, they do a, a, another story reminding everybody what happened. <laughs> But it says a gruesome tale how Jean Baptiste, the grave robber, was banished, was branded and banished. The ghastly sequel is the discovery of his crumbling skeleton with chain and all Now, it's been found that this was kind of hyped up. Um, his skeleton or the chain of ball attached, nobody knows um, if that was really him. Probably not. They did find a skeleton with a chain and ball attached but they don't think it was John Baptiste. But this article kind of resurrected the, the, the myth and the story. And if you read about this, there's not a lot out there on the internet, but it's interesting how a lot of it is, is uh, you know, you're just blowing out of proportion and just uh, don't, don't believe everything you read. <laughs> but, uh, um, so so this, is, this is where I took that quote from where Henry Heath wrote about what happened, uh, about him. <laughs> Uh, confronting John Baptiste and, and John Baptiste confessing, and so so it was such an uproar in the city that even Brigham Young uh, commented on this at the Salt Lake City Tabernacle on February 9, 1862, and his remarks are very interesting. Um, I'll read some of them to you. So he, he first, the purpose of his speech was to calm the people down, because I mean, they really, they were really, you know, they, these people had come from all over the world, immigrants from everywhere. And uh, Utah is a fairly uh, new settlement, but a real melting pot. People from, you know, all over Europe, and, and uh, uh, they were very superstitious at that time, too. And, you know, a lot of people brought their superstitions, and that's what he says to them is he, he tells them that um, the power and influence of tradition has a great deal to do with the way we feel about the matter of our dead being robbed. But he goes on to say how in Europe, robbing the dead is not a new thing. So he's trying to make the case that this has happened before. You know, In fact, in Europe, it happens a lot. You know, think about all the tombs that have been robbed and and they would actually, in Europe, have people watch over the cemeteries just to keep people from digging up the body. So it's not a new thing, he's saying. You know, it's the first time it's happened here, but don't get too upset. And then he also makes the argument that, um, uh, that, you know, he says, I am unable to think so low as to fully get at such a mean, contemptible, damnable trick. You know, so he said, you know, this is really bad. 
He said, but then he, he assures him, he says, I will defy any thief there is on the earth or in hell to rob a saint of one blessing. A thief may dig up dead bodies and sell them for the dissecting knife or may take their raiment from them. But when the resurrection takes place, the saints will come forth with all the glory, beauty, and excellency of resurrected saints, clothed, clothed as they were when they were laid away. Some may inquire whether it is necessary to put fresh linen into the coffins of those who have been robbed of their clothing. As to this, you can pursue the course that will give you the most contentment and satisfaction. Because a lot of the people, when this happened, immediately started going digging up the graves to find out if their loved ones had been robbed, and whether they were clothed or not. And he says, you can do whatever you want. And, but he says, this is hilarious, he says, um, um, I do not trouble myself about my dead. And he had, he had relatives that were buried in that cemetery. He says, if they are stripped of their clothing, I do not want to know it. <laughs> a, a, little bit of, a little bit of dark humor, but uh, it sure wasn't funny at the time. <laughs> but they did take all the clothing and, and articles that were found in Jean-Baptiste's trunks and house, and they spread them out on tables in the county courthouse, and people could come and claim the property. Um, so then the question was, what to do about Jean-Baptiste? Because a lot of people just wanted him to be hung. They wanted to kill him. But Brigham Young recommended, and this idea was probably circulated, but they recommended that he be banished. And um, I saw an interesting case from Winnemucca just recently where Judge Montero banished somebody from returning to the county. He says, I'm going to let you on probation, but you can't return to Humboldt County. Right? But that was overturned. They say, you can't, you can't do that. <laughs> Either put him in jail or put him on probation, but you can't banish him, uh, even though we would like to. But back in the old days, you could banish them. There, there wasn't any law against it. And so they banished him. And, uh, and it's interesting that it was, in part, an act of compassion, because a lot of people wanted this man dead. Um, but uh, they banished him. Uh, some say that he was branded, and when they mean branded with indelible ink on his forehead, it said, um, I think it said, um, for robbing the dead. That's what, it, that's what they tattooed on his forehead and banished him. But they banished him to an interesting place, um, this island in, Salt, in the Great Salt Lake. Uh, there's only about five islands in the Great Salt Lake. There's Antelope Island, Fremont Island, those are the two big ones. There's uh, Stan Stansbury Island, which is, it's an island because it's usually mostly surrounded by water, but in, when the water drops, you know, it's right there as you're driving into Salt Lake, you see uh, there's a kind of a rocky point before you get onto the lake and and before you get to Tooele. Um, and in fact, there's a, there's a place in Tooele called Stansbury Park but that's all named after this island, the other island. But, but Fremont Island, uh, completely surrounded by water all the time. So it was the logical place to, to banish him. And there was an old shack on the, on the island, so when they dropped him off there, he had provisions, um, and, and within a few weeks, he disappeared. And so they, there were some boards missing from the shack, and so they think that he turned the shack into a canoe. And, and got out of there. Later there were reports that he was seen in Montana, apparently from a credible source. We don't know. Um, there was also reports that maybe that skeleton they found with a ball and chain might have been him, but probably not, because he didn't have a ball and chain on it. Um, there's an interesting uh, movie that was just recently made about eight or nine years ago. Um, uh, it's called, uh, what is it? Uh, um, is there, I forget the title right now, but, but there's a, a film, but it focuses mostly on his banishment. You know, very little leading up to that, but it just shows, you know, how he was captured for robbing the dead and banished to this island, and it kind of focuses on um, the sheriff was actually going back and forth and, and delivering provisions to him while he was on the island, according to the movie. So, um... So I'm getting to the end of the presentation, but 
I hope they make a movie out of this someday because it would be a great, a great movie to combine all those stories about the Egans, um, about Rome and Porter Rockwell and the, and them being shot in the jail in Salt Lake and then discovering this, this, uh, this grave robbing um, through Rome, Rome's uh, burial. And it's quite a sequence of events. Um, so here's another picture of the Great Salt Lake. Those are the islands I was mentioning. So the freeway comes right here, you know, around this point, and across, you know how you cross water there? And then you come into Tooele, and then up to Salt Lake. You know, kind of come around the, the, uh, the tower there. Interesting fact that that smokestack that's there is the tallest structure west of the Mississippi. <laughs> Taller than any skyscraper in San Francisco or Los Angeles. Um, so the next time you go by there, you can admire that. <laughs> and, uh, and here's Stansbury Island, Antelope Island, this is Fremont Island. Okay. And so Ogden is here. This is Promontory Point. The, you know, the Golden Spike was up here where the railroad crosses north of the lake, just to give you some reference. But I really appreciate you all coming out and hearing this great story. Do you have, did anybody have any questions before we finish? Mr. Uh, Bill. Is Roman Clausen buried in Draper then? Yes, they did remove his body and it is buried in Draper. I haven't been to that site, uh, <coughs> but I have a, my list to do next time I'm over there. I'll check it out. They'll look at it. Yeah. Uh, oh, another interesting point is. I started out by talking about Howard Egan, who had established the trails, and, and then it, interestingly how um, Brigham Young says, you know, um, you know, I don't, you know, don't worry too much about your dead, you know, they're dead, and, and it doesn't, and he also makes the point, it doesn't matter if they're eaten up, you know, buried at sea, eaten up by sharks or whatever, <laughs> so, you know, um, it's, it's the soul, not the body that, that is more important, but, uh, interestingly, when Brigham Young was buried in Salt Lake City, guess who watched over his grave day and night to guard it? So ironically, he had somebody watch his grave. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that was Howard Egan, the very the same man. <laughs> that, that was, I mean, just another coincidence in this story that uh, so many lives were intertwined back then. Yes, Brad? The uh, trail that they built, is that part of the Overland Freight Trail that, that came in later? Is that part, part of the same trail that went through Ruby Valley? Yes, yeah, that's the Pony Express route, same as the Overland Stage route. Yeah. So they, they ran stagecoaches across there. And when the railroad came in, it kind of pretty much made them out of business. Yeah, once the railroad was built, 1869, that trail became obsolete. So if you go drive that trail now, you'll just find two track roads. And, and it's, it's fun. When we're out on that road, we always ride at night. It doesn't matter if the mail's coming east to west or west to east from Missouri to Sacramento. That's the, the route. We always get it at night every year. And so Justin and Stephanie and I, we were always up at midnight waiting for the mail. It usually comes about 1 o'clock. And, and they always do it on a full moon for safety, you know, just so that you're riding by some light. But it's so fun riding in the middle of the night. You'll just be standing out on the range with your horse and all alone. And pretty soon off in the distance, first the horse can hear it. And the horse will start <laughs> and pretty soon you can hear that rider coming. And it's so fun to exchange the mail, jump on and just go at a gallop for five miles and then transfer the ride. To go about five miles takes about 20 to 25 minutes, full gallop in the saddle. Uh, a lot of fun riding next to your shadow in the moonlight. Yeah. But, and it's fun as, as I'm out there thinking about these stories all alone, um, you start thinking about the people that were on that trail, like um, uh, um, Sam Clemens, you know, uh, Mark Twain. You know, these, these characters were the ones that were traveling back and forth to Virginia City on that trail in those times. It's, it's fun to think about them being on that very same dirt that we're on. Yes, Andy? What were the details of this escape from uh, the Salt Lake Jail? There's not a lot of details. Of course, with any police shooting, there's always talk that maybe they shot him unprovoked. You know? But 
I can't think they deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> but they were shot in the back. That means they were running, right? So. <laughs> yes? They do, yes. In fact, it'll be going through Ruby Valley on June 6th this year. So, yeah, we'll be out there. And we'll hand off the mail at the top of the... Is it going... Which way is it going? It's going uh, east this year, right? Yeah, east this year. So, so, so um, it might even be Justin that rides it up. Or I think Andy, Andy Boy, Boyer is going to ride up the diamonds this year. He'll take it up that pass I showed you and drop it off to the next rider at the top of the Diamond Mountains, and then another team will take it down into Ruby Valley and, and through over and pass them through Ruby Valley and on into Utah. So, it's pretty cool. It takes about a day to cross the valley, about a day and a night. Yes, Fred? About how far apart were those uh, extensions? They're, they were about 10 miles apart. Um, because each rider would take it about 30 miles on three different horses. And some of the stations were designed for sleeping and cooking and everything, and other ones were just for exchanging mounts. So you know they had quite a network of moving the horses and keeping fresh mounts all the time. But some of the stations were more prominent than others. And an interesting fact, back, back in those days, uh, the fuel of the West was grass, you know, because horses and cattle had to eat grass. So it's interesting to see those old ranches along the, the route there are some of the earliest ranches in Nevada with some of the earliest water rights. And, and that, that's interesting for me as an attorney to see that when, I, when I'm in water issues and stuff. I, I know that history and I say, oh, I know exactly why that ranch has the first water rights because it was part of the Pony Express fuel station. Those are the gas stations. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? All right, well, thanks for coming out. And uh, thank, thank you so much for sharing this story with me. Thank you.